Hi everybody, I'm Idiot Vig and this is Backgammon Made Complicated. Today we're starting off on a brand new series, From Kitchen to Competition. If you're checking out this channel, one of the reasons you might want to check out this channel is because you're somebody who's a social backgammon player, but you're interested in more. Maybe you've seen some of my earlier videos that show some live play. Maybe you've been watching videos of people who know a heck of a lot more than I do with, with their play. Or, or maybe you've seen some online matches as well and, and, and uh, you're, you're interested in, 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 in playing in more competitive situations. That's what this series is designed to do. Today, we're going to be talking about equity. And later, we'll be talking about what PR is. But for right now, we're talking about equity. And it's, it's not just an important concept. It's, it's the concept in backgammon. What is equity? Equity is a way of stating the value of your position over the board. And it's not a function of the checkers or the cube or anything that's there. It's a function of six simple data points. Your wins, your gammons, your backgammon wins, your single losses, your gammon losses, and your backgammon losses. That's it. That's what's going on behind the scenes. That's what drives all the computer analysis for what's there. And the objective is, is simple. You know, you, you want to win, but you, to get there, you want to increase your equity as much as possible. You want to increase your wins, your gammons, your backgammons, while minimizing your losses, your gammon losses, your backgammon losses. Let's take a look and see how it works. So here, I've got a spreadsheet up, and uh, this link will be in the comments for anybody who wants to make a copy of their own and play around with this. We've got uh, some simple figures on screen that show just that, the wins and the losses, and there's some other stuff that's there. So when you're filling this out, uh, only five data points need to be entered. All three of your wins, and then the gammon and backgammon losses. The very first thing to note is single wins and losses, those always add up to 100%. So if I'm 50% to win and this increases to 75% to win, single losses are going to decrease accordingly. Singles always add up to 100%. However, Gammons and backgammons, both wins and losses, those are a function of the checkers that are on the board. And those are always variable. And those don't have any direct relationship with one another. So we're always going to be changing those kinds of values. For now, we're looking at the defaults. So assuming evenly matched opponents, we've got 50% wins, 50% losses. Gammon wins, uh, there's, you know, it, it's accepted that get the, the number of games that are going to end in a backgammon is somewhere in the, the mid 20%. So I just grabbed a, a reasonable looking figure to, for the start of the game. Um, and there's going to be a small amount of backgammon wins, usually between 1% to 2%. For simplicity's sake, I've, I've made it a nominal value here. Now, you may have seen this when we changed the figures before, but keep an eye out for what happens to our equity. And we're calling it cubeless equity. We're going to talk a little bit more about cubeless and its, its weird cousin in just a little bit. But pay attention to the values as we go ahead and we change the single wins. Right now we're just going to increase it from 50, not typo, to 60. Everything else is the same. Our gammon wins and losses are the same. Our backgammon wins and losses are the same. But now we're winning 60% of the time and we're losing 40% of the time. Our equity is 0.2. And that's because our equity is made up of our win difference, our gammon difference, and our backgammon difference. Here, these values of 60 and 40% really represent 0.6 of that one game we're playing for, and 0.4 of that one game we're playing for. And the difference there is 0.2.
because we don't yet have any differences in gammons or backgammons, our cubeless equity is the same as the win difference. So we increased it by 10% and it jumped up 0.2. What happens if we increase it 20 more percent? We can see that same change is happening. The difference in single wins and single losses when gammons and backgammons are either equal or uh, not in play is equal to the difference in our wins. 0.8 minus 0.2. Okay, well, what about gammons? Well, before we start digging into the, to the gammon and backgammon numbers, which I cannot say easily, let's talk about the figures that we're looking at. You might see percentages like these and say, well, wait a minute, does that mean that uh, since you're winning 50% of the time and you're gammoning 13% of the time, that really 13% uh, of half of all games are gammons for us? That's an excellent question, and the answer is no. For simplicity's sake, and this is consistent across all the analysis you'll see in, in bots or in print online, the figures are always expressed as percentages of how often they occur out of all outcomes. They are not a function of wins. So here we're saying, you so, know, suppose we played 100 games that perfectly had this distribution. 50 games would be wins. 13 of those would be gammon wins, and one of those would be backgammon wins. The same for my opponent. And you're saying, wait a second, idiot. And you're saying, idiot, because we're pals, and that's okay, because I'll answer to that, I'll answer to Vig, I'll, I'll answer to a lot of things, even pejoratives. Uh, and, and you say, hang on, idiot, this is, this is now 64%. How can we have 64% if we're only winning 50% of games? And the very quick answer is we're double counting. These gammon wins are baked into your single wins. Same with backgammons. They're part of those 50%. We're saying you win 50 times out of 100, uh, and of those wins, 13 were gammons, one were backgammon, and the remaining 36 were single wins. So that's what the percentages mean. Okay, all right, that's, that's all well and good. But what happens if we go ahead and we increase the gammons? Right now we're at 13%. Let's keep everything else the same. And let's bump this up 10 more percent to 23. Well, wait a second. We increased single wins by that same 10% before, and our equity was 0.2. We just increased our gammon wins 10%, and now our cubeless equity is only 0.1. What's going on? And the answer to that is from what we just talked about. Gammons are already baked into your single wins. So here, we just used a superficial example where all we did was increase the gammons. We said, you know what, uh, we mysteriously found some magical play where all of our single wins stay the same, but it gets us 10% more gammons. And our equity said, okay, that's great, but you haven't won anymore. I'll, I'll give you something, but it's, it's, it's not going to change our opponent's equity in this example because we haven't changed their gammon losses. We haven't changed their, their, their single losses. Um, and, and here, sorry, we shouldn't be thinking about this as two players. We should always be thinking about these six figures as, as your own equity. We're going to get into a practical example in just a second. Um, but here, we're in this position where we're winning 23% gammons, and our opponent is only gammoning us 13% of the time. And with everything else equal, that difference is only 10%. 0.1. That gives us our gammon difference with no other factors in play. There's our cubeless equity. So what are we, what are we learning from this? He says as he attempts to both type and speak at the same time.
must have been thrown and watch me type all that out. So before we saw that if there's a play that increases wins, uh, that's got a big jump on our equity because it increases our single wins at the same time it decreases our opponent's wins. Or, or rather decreases uh, our, our single losses. Okay, so we're just writing down what we've seen here. And, and by themselves, you know, just on the surface, these aren't too valuable on their own, and they can even seem a little bit counterintuitive. But we're just keeping track of what we've learned so far. We can go back and clean this up later. Oftentimes, well, virtually always, any play is going to change both your single wins, your gammon wins, your backgammon wins, as well as your gammon losses and backgammon losses. So it's gonna get a little bit more complicated than this. We're just saying isolated by themselves, we're seeing that just a change to gammons doesn't make as much of a change in equity to backgammons, or to, to, to single, as, as single wins did. Uh, what about backgammons? Because you just attempted to say that. Fair enough, let's increase it by that same 10%. That's gonna give us 10% more backgammons than our opponents. Well, what's going on? Wait a minute, gammons are three times as valuable as single wins, and I gave myself 10% more without changing anything else, and my equity's still the same as if I gave myself 10% extra gammons. Exact same thing with BGs. If our single wins don't change, that increases in gammons or backgammons are not going to have the same effect that increases in single wins will. So let's change this to gammons or backgammons only. Now you may say that and think, well, gammons and backgammons don't sound very valuable and that's not true at all. We're gonna get into that in future videos. Let's take something that's a little bit or rather, let's, let's, uh, let's take a variant of the position. So let's go back to our example where we increased our gammons 10% and we didn't change everything else, anything else. What percent single wins would we need in order for our cubeless equity to be zero? So the difference between our gammon wins and gammon losses is still 10%. And we might think, oh, okay, we're just gonna offset that 10%. But our equity, it turns out to be negative afterwards. And that's because the amount we increased it by didn't just, or decreased it by for our side, didn't just decrease it for us, it also increased it for our opponent. So instead, if we take half the amount and reduce that 5%, now that 0.05 difference in wins is also offset by 0.05 extra single losses. And our win difference is now exactly the same, but negative, as our gammon difference. And we add all these three up, and we get zero. So for every 1% extra gammons, we need to make sure we're not losing at least 0.5% single wins to increase our equity. And the same is true for back gammons as well. Now those last few words, to increase our equity. That's why we're doing all this. That's why we're looking at a spreadsheet. That's why we haven't been looking at positions. That's what top level backgammon is. You want to increase your equity. That is, you want to be able to make the best play possible. In backgammon, there are four things that determine whether or not you win or lose. How well you roll, 
how well your opponent rolls, how well your opponent plays, and how well you play. And of those, you get control over exactly one. You can only control how well you play. That's it. Anything else is just the dice or your opponent skillfully or, or, or neglectfully handling the checkers. That's it. There's a lot that's out of your control. But the one thing that is in your control is finding the play that maximizes your equity. Or if you want to get pessimistic, that, that uh, uh, doesn't give up any equity as well. So let's take a look at an example from a money game against XG. So here we are on the darker checkers, and I have this 5-2 to play. And we can see from the left here that I elected to play 23 to 18 and 13 to 11. The computer doesn't like this as much as simply running out to the 16 point. But take a look at what's going on in the analysis in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. Now we have two different sets of numbers and those are the same as our winning singles, gammons, backgammons, and, and same for losses. So let's go ahead and plug those in for a moment. So I've got 44.5 according to that. That We're starting with the best play. It's giving us these figures for wins, gammons, and backgammons because there's our 44.5, Our 55 is already taken care of. That's great. And this play loses some number of gammons and some number of backgammons. There we go. So we've got it all there. And our cubeless equity is minus 0.196. That doesn't exactly match. Well, hang on a sec. Let's just check out the other one for a second to make sure that the same kind of behavior, or the, the, the same sort of trends we'd expect exist. So now let's change it to the worst play. 43.4, 10 10.7, 0.5, 21.3, and 0.9. Okay. And yeah, our cubeless equity did get worse. The difference was by about 0 0.05 or so. But how come those numbers don't exactly match the totals that we see here? And that's an excellent question. It's also something that's worthy of many, 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 many videos. Um, the short answer is what we've been looking at so far is just cubeless equity. So we're not considering the value of the cube. And when you're playing competitively, the cube is always in play. Now, because this was a money game, yeah, you know, we have this thing called cube full equity. So if the cube was at a higher value, like two or four or eight, you know, we can see that our cube full equity is the cube less equity times the cube value. Okay, idiot. Well, that's all well and good, but that still doesn't explain why we see slightly different numbers. The very short answer for that right now is that owning the cube has value. And, uh, also being able to, to, to double <laughs> at, at, a, at an efficient time has value. So these figures are accounting future cube ownership into the quality of the plays. And if we mouse over these, like I've been doing before, we can now see that cubeless equity of the top candidate of minus 0.196 equals our calculations from before, and our cubeless equity of minus 0.243 matches what's there, uh, plus or minus some rounding. There's factors into cube access and value that makes these values of 275 and 343 different than the 196 and 242 that we saw before. But the point is, as you have plays that give up more gammons or, or win more gammons, they're going to impact your equity. So it's important to just sort of, you know, 
understand how these relationships work. And maybe you're the kind of person who does that best by manipulating data in a spreadsheet. Fantastic, we've got this right here. Check the description in the link. Okay, so this is just sort of what's going on behind the scenes. And this is just sort of the math and the empiricism that, that explains you know, what happens when we consider a play and whether or not one is better than the other and how it's quantified to be better than the other. What does that mean for us in terms of our progression as backgammon players? Don't we want to just go to tournaments and just win, win, win? I mean, yes, obviously, you absolutely do. And that's not how your skill as a backgammon player is measured. Luck's going to have tons and tons and tons of impact, particularly in the short term, and we're going to get into that in a future video too. But what it means is that in order to understand, you know, who's really the best in the world, who's really playing better. What we do have is empirical analysis of how good your plays were versus very, very high computer settings, things that are so good that they're, they're, they're obviously better than any player in the world. And that brings us to performance rating, PR. It is the, 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 the one size fits all label that describes how well you did, how well you're doing, you know, some, some kind of, of indication of what was the skill level. And the way that's measured in backgammon is by calculating how much equity you gave up and then figuring out how many decisions did you have and then normalize that total. So what was your average error rate per decision? And that's what PR is. So as a reference, on this worksheet, we take a look. Uh, it says equity given up per move. I should really say decision because it counts the cube as cube decisions too, and that's super, super important. And I'm not gonna go through all of this, but we have this broken out into a couple of uh, uh, different categories here. So some of the videos that I've had on my channel, that was my first submission to BMAB, uh, Backgammon Masters Awarding Body, which is the only sanctioning body designed to award titles. To players and the title that you get is based on what your PR is for reference here I've included the equity per move these are all linear so your equity given up per move and your PR that's that's a factor of 500 the PR is a much much more readable figure than equity is and also technically equity is negative so the actual calculation is your uh, your average equity per decision times negative 500 gets you your PR. At any rate, you know, there's different kinds of levels that there. And the truth is, if you are somebody who's been playing at home and, and not for very long, we're, we're, looking, we're looking off the bottom of the table here. That's okay. <laughs> we all got to start somewhere. I started here. Mochi started here. And do you, I tried to compare myself to him. Did, did you like that? It's It's one of the few ways that I could, but we're going to be bad. We're going to be bad to start. And I need you to embrace that bad because backgammon is not just a game of getting things right. It's ensuring that when you're wrong, you're not wrong by a lot. And when you start out, there's so much to understand. There, there's so much that's new conceptually. And not just will you get things wrong, but you'll get things fantastically wrong. And this also happens even as you improve. You continue to get things fantastically wrong. And, and, and you know, you give up massive amounts of equity on single plays. I, you know, the, the last set of videos from the NEBC for me had a, had a pass error for me at the end of game two in the finals against David Kornwitz. It was a 700 error. Uh, sorry, I say a 700 error. The error was 0 0.700. So worth seven tenths of one point. Uh, you know, I think my error rate in that game was something like 80 or 90. That, that's going to happen. It, variance happens. Human happens. You know, our brains are not computers. And that's where the idiot vig comes from. We're going to work on improving that. But you're probably down here at the bottom of this table. That's okay. We're going to get you to some place. Because if you're going to start playing competitively around the club, we want to move you up into at least intermediate. So, you know, your goal, if you're brand new at this and you, you want to start playing more is for a long-term P 
PR. And I cannot stress long-term enough because this takes tons and tons and tons of decisions. You don't want to be chasing your PRs from match to match, you know, feeling elated or, or rejected just because of how you performed. Oh, that's terrible. This is long-term stuff. So think dozens, if not hundreds of matches. If you want to start playing more around the club, you want to look towards getting into that intermediate type range. And you know, if uh, this could even be something that if you've got an ABT event nearby, um, play, being at right around 15, uh, you're, you're going to know enough, whoops, you're gonna know enough uh, to be able to, 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 you know, hang for a little bit in the open event, um, but you know, the, the expectations shouldn't be too great. It's, it's definitely uh, more of a PR range that's better for an intermediate tournament. And if it's large enough that a novice tournament is also run as a third level, um, you would definitely be a strong favorite there. You work towards improving your PR and you'll get up to some kind of club play. And that's what we're going to focus on. How do we get through all this? And then once you get there, you're going to work towards advancing a little bit further. And by the time you have your eyes set on single digits, well, now, you know, that's something where you can definitely compete in ABT open events, no problem whatsoever. Um, and you've got this, this, this nice looking advance title to go with it. Uh, you'd have to submit all that to BMAB. Nick Blazier's got some good videos on that. You know, you can check those out for more details on how to get that. Um, and then you improve a little bit further. And by the time you're down to a six and a half PR, that's where they start handing out the master rankings. And this is what I'm gunning for right now. After, um, after all the ABT stuff that I posted, I think those first five matches, I ended up around like uh, 675 thereabouts. Um, now I don't, ha I haven't played enough to, to qualify for a title yet. I've got to get another, another, um, another five or six matches under my belt. But right now this is my goal to get to master. And then from there, you know, who knows, maybe I'll have some content going for M2, going for M1, but all of the great big titles, all, all of the, the great big names in the world, it all starts here. And that is when your PR is equal or less than four. That's the very first Grand Master rank. You would have had to have achieved that for 300 XP. So, uh, you know, that's like you know, 30 and change, seven point matches. You would have to play a PR of four. So if you think about how many decisions that is, you know, a seven point match maybe has about, I don't know, maybe a hundred decisions. It might be on the high side. Uh, but it, we're talking about 3,000 plus decisions where across all of those decisions, you are averaging less than one one hundredth of a point of equity. Half of a percent of winning chances per move. That's how good the Grandmasters are. And there's more titles than just that. Then there's also Super Grand Master Mochi, who broke the game. Nothing existed beyond Grandmaster. These segmented titles didn't even exist before him, and he broke the mold so much. Now they're Super Grandmasters. So maybe that's you. With a little bit more play, a little bit more practice. We're going to get there in steps. And if you're down here, if you, if you were playing around the kitchen and you're interested in playing at the local club, stick around. We can get you an intermediate. Tons more coming up, but sit back, relax. If you've got some old matches, now that you understand a little more, you can go back and start to go through them a little bit more. I'll warn you that the cube full equities, those reasons why the totals were different at money versus the cubeless equities, those get way out of whack with tournament play. We're going to have a separate series just for that. So plenty on this to come. But in the meantime, you know, mess around. Understand a little bit more about how wins, gammons, and backgammons change things. Um, because understanding how those risks and how those rewards work, that's what makes you a better backgammon player. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Remember, Games only get tougher when you want to improve.